into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. And they went and found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, Jesus came. While they were at the table eating, Jesus spoke. I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. One who is eating with me. And the disciples were saddened, talking amongst themselves. And one by one, they began to reflect sorrowfully and say to him, Lord, is it me? Here I am, James, son of Alphaeus, celebrating the Passover with Jesus. Jesus, the one who I believe is God's beloved son. It doesn't seem that long ago when I first saw him. I'll never forget that day. I was walking down the road near the Jordan where John was baptizing. Naturally, being curious of what was going on, I stopped for a closer look. That's when I saw him, Jesus. When I heard him ask John to baptize him, at first, John tried to discourage him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? But Jesus insisted, saying, Let it be so for now, for in this way we shall do all that God requires. So John agreed. After Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened up, and the Spirit of God came down like a dove and rested on him. And there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I followed Jesus as he went about teaching and preaching to the people. It was my good fortune that he noticed me and chose me to be one of his twelve disciples. Since that moment, I have spent so much time with him and I have tried to learn as much about him and his heavenly Father as I could. And now, one of us is to betray him. Surely, it's madness to think that it could be true. But I keep asking myself, is it me, Lord? Is it me? Like Zacchaeus, I was a tax collector. I was once called Levi, but Jesus changed my name to Matthew when he asked me to follow him. He passed by in my office when I was collecting taxes. Follow me, he said, and I arose and followed him. Later, when I held a great feast for him in my home, 
Many of my business friends and some of the disciples were present. When the Pharisees complained about Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Since the day I left my own life to follow him, I have studied our scriptures closely, and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the fulfillment of every prophecy about the coming Messiah, God's anointed. I've listened carefully to his sermons, and I've been thinking about writing them in a book, proving that he is the Messiah from our sacred writings. I especially want to record his sermon about the good news of the kingdom of God, the sermon he first delivered on the mountain in Galilee three years ago. It is a new gospel, good news for all the world that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, he has given us awful, tragic news that one of us will betray him. Who can it be? Will they suspect me because I was once a hated tax collector? Do I even suspect myself? Is it me? Lord, is it me? We found him, the one who Moses and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. Those are the words that my friend Philip told me and Nathaniel almost three and a half years ago. I'll never forget the question I put to Philip that day. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I didn't say anything scored or sarcastically, but those of us who are familiar with her lands and her alleys always wondered, why would God place his anointed one there? However, Philip simply replied and said to me, Come and see. When Jesus saw me, he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, I was taken by surprise, because I was a stranger to him. How do you know me? He answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I thought about that for a moment, and I was baffled. How did he know? I've always wanted to be a disciple of a great teacher, and in my country, men that wished to learn of a rabbi would wait under trees, waiting for the right one to walk by so that we could ask to be his disciple. And that along with the truth that a, a fruitful fig tree in Israel is a sign of God's rest and peace, I've always thought it was the perfect place to meditate on the law and the prophets and think about the coming Messiah. When Jesus said he saw me, I believe he saw my heart and passion for the deliverance of Israel. Rabbi, I said, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You know, since that time, I've served him as a faithful disciple. But now he introduces this new ceremony to us, and it's to take the place of the Passover. And he tells us that one of us is going to betray him. How can that be? How can one of us be a traitor? We are his closest friends. But I keep thinking, is it me? Lord? Is it me? I'm James, the brother of John. Jesus called us to follow him while we were bending our nets by the Sea of Galilee, along with our father Zebedee one day almost three years ago. We were honored when Jesus wanted us as his disciples, and were humbled when he chose both of us to be among the twelve. Our brother Solomon was quite aggressive on our behalf and pushed us to solidify our position with Jesus in his kingdom. So on the way to Jerusalem last week, she knelt before Jesus and made this request of him. Grant that one of these two sons of mine sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. He replied, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup 
I'm going to drink? We said, yes, Lord, we are able. Then Jesus said to us, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my Father. The others were angry when they heard of our request. Jesus then reminded us that he who would be first must be the servant of all. Later on, he demonstrated his humbleness by washing our feet on this very night, just before supper. And now, he who taught us the way of love is to be betrayed by one of those who we loved? Who could it be? Why should one of us do such a thing? I keep thinking deep down inside my own heart. Is it me? Lord, is it me? I'm a simple man with a simple faith. But I've tried to do what I could to serve Jesus with the gifts and talents he gave me. The others nicknamed me Andrew the Bringer, because all I've ever done is bring others to Jesus. I brought my brother Peter to Jesus, and I am so happy to see how much he's grown in his walk with the Lord. I'm the one who brought the boy with the five loaves of bread and two fish to Jesus the day he fed 5,000. And just recently, some Greeks came seeking to worship the Master. No one knew what to do with them, so I was called in once more to bring them to Jesus. They must have seen something of value in me, which the others overlooked, because he selected me to be one of his twelve disciples. I've been close to him ever since. I may not have been in the inner circle like Peter, but I've been a true friend and companion to my Lord. I've had the chance to serve him faithfully. What more could a humble fisherman ask for? And now, one of us is to betray him. It's unthinkable. Who could it be? How could he live with himself? And yet, I find myself asking, could it be Andrew the Bringer? Is it me? Lord, is it me? the twin. I don't look upon my life with gloom or despondency. I demand proof before I can believe. I need to see before committing myself. People think that I'm a man of doubt, but I know that I'm a man of daring. That day when, when Mary and Martha, they sent word to our Lord that their brother Lazarus was there. Jesus turned to us and he said, let us go to him. But lately the Jews, they wanted to stone Jesus, and, and fearing for his life, some of the disciples warned Jesus about going to Bethany. Yet my deep faith in our Lord, I, I had no doubts, and I spoke up, and I rebuked them, saying, Let us also go with him, so we may die with him. And Jesus again said, Lazarus is dead. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Of course, everyone knows how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Yet he was in the tomb for four days. Why? Why do people remember my doubts and forget my daring? They remember the questions and, and overlook the affirmations. They remember my fears and forget my faith. I used to go fishing with some of the others. And how well I remember the Beatitudes he spoke on the horns of hate. And that was the first year of his public ministry. I can almost see him rebuking those stormy winds of Galilee. He healed the sick and he cured the disease and he opened the eyes of the blind. And stopping those deaf ears, he, he also cleansed the leopards and, and he preached. He preached the gospel to the poor. Yet opposition has developed and his enemies are determined to destroy him. They would make us God's servant. Well, they, they would make God their servant. And now he says that even among us, the chosen twelve, that there's a traitor. Is he speaking of me? Is it me? Lord, is it me? 
Jesus. Amen. Amen. It was Jesus who chose the twelve of us to follow him. I feel unworthy to even be numbered among the disciples, yet he selected me. That is, how well I remember that day. After a night in prayer, he called us to him and gave us authority over unclean spirits. 
and even the power to heal every kind of disease and infirmity. I was in Jerusalem when he gave a great invitation. Come unto me, O ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I also remember once when the disciples were gathered around Jesus, I broke my accustomed silence and asked Jesus a question that had been troubling me. I asked, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to those that love you, and not to the world? I wanted the world to know him as we did, we who were close to him. I shall never forget his reply. He said, whoever loves me will obey my message. My father will love him, and we will come to him and live with him. Whoever does not love me does not obey my words. The message you have heard is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. And now, he who came to share men's burdens has a burden thrust upon him. The knowledge that one of us will betray him. Which one of us can it be? Who is the traitor? The man we least suspect? Or will all of us betray him before the night is over? Philip, and Peter, and Judas, and John. Even Thaddeus, is it me, Lord, is it me? I come from the same near the Sea of Galilee. While several of my friends and I were in Bethany listening to the preaching of John the Baptist, Jesus called Andrew and Peter to become his disciples. The following day, before traveling to Galilee, Jesus came to me saying, Philip, follow me. From that moment to this, I have steadfastly followed the master. I remember so well before he had fed the five thousand with five loaves and two fish that I asked him and the others, Where are we to buy bread that all of these will eat? Little did I know that Andrew was already born a young lad with his lunch to Jesus. When the Greeks came to me, and asked for an interview with the Master. I turned them over to Andrew who brought them to Jesus. When Jesus first told us that God was our Heavenly Father, it was almost beyond my understanding. However, as I have listened to the Master, I have grown to understand his words. I feel in my heart that he who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. Because everything one hopes to find in the Father, I find in Jesus. And nothing I would not want to find in the Father do I find in the Son. Now, having seen the Father through him, he shocks us by telling us that the betrayer of Christ. Does the traitor not know that in betraying Jesus, he's also betraying God? Then he's conspiring against Jesus, he's conspiring against God. Can one of our number be so blind? Who can it be? Can it be Philip? Is it me? Lord, is it me? After Jesus called Peter and Andrew to follow him, he came to me and my brother James. We were in the boat nearby with our father Zebedee, mending our nets. He called to us, and immediately we dropped everything and followed him. Since that time, I have tried to understand Jesus by loving him. Sometimes I believe that he is as much of God as we will ever see in human form. Yet I love him as a person, and he returns my love. Sometimes he calls me the beloved disciple. I have shared in his trials as well as in his hours of victory. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we beheld his glory. Peter and I completed the arrangements for the celebration of the Passover here in this upper room tonight because he numbers us in his close, intimate circle. It was me that he told about his walk with Nicodemus when he spoke those wonderful words. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Someday, I, I want to write down some of his sayings 
and his many wonderful deeds, so that others may read them and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him, they may have eternal life, just as he promised. Yet he just said that one of us was a betrayer. I cannot believe it. Yet it must be so. Else he would not have said it. Who could it be? I know that Jesus nicknamed my brother and I the Sons of Thunder, partly because we tend to be a little bit hot-headed. But we've only used that sign in our natures in defense of our master. Surely it could not be my brother he refers to, or Peter, or Andrew. How could it be John, the beloved disciple? Is it me? Or is it me? I am Simon the Zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to a group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries known as the Zealots. We are all for armed rebellion against Rome. We believe in crushing our enemies under our heels and establishing the ancient glory that was Israel's in the days of David and Solomon. But Jesus tells of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the human heart, where God reigns there supremely. And since I have heard him, I have changed my mind and also my allegiance. He has shown me that the conquest of the heart is the only true, sincere, and lasting conquest. So I have given to him my highest loyalty and deepest devotion. I have unconditionally and completely surrendered myself to him. And since that time, I have become more understanding, kinder, wiser. I desire to think his thoughts, to love as he loves, to obey as he obeys, and to serve as he serves. This surrender has imprisoned me, rather to set me free for the first time in my life. I no longer fear wrong, she's mighty, but God is almighty. And now, the Master says there is a spiritual realm within our group, one who would attempt by force what could only be conquered by love? Who, who can he be? Matthew the publican? The, the big fisherman or his brother? Or does he suspect me since I'm the only former zealot among us? Is it me? Lord, is it me? into the water, Jesus walked by and said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We immediately laid down our nets and followed him. Then another morning while fishing, Jesus said, Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. But I said, Master, we have been fishing all night and we've caught nothing. But as you say, you will let down the nets. We caught so many fish, we had to call out to other nearby boats just to contain the catch. When we reached the shore, I remember falling at the feet of Jesus and crying out, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. But instead of leaving me, he told me, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And then when we were near Caesarea Philippi, he changed my name. From Simon to Peter, which means the rock. And then he said, on this rock I will build my church. But yet a moment later, when I protest against, protested against his going to Jerusalem to suffer death at the hands of evil men, he rebuked me and said, get thee behind me, Satan. So am I a mixture of good and evil? Of godliness and devilishness? Tonight, when he said one of us would betray him, I promised to follow him even to death. But yet he warned me that before the rooster crowed twice, I would have denied him three times. You know, even though the others, they come in the big fisherman. In his presence, they feel small and unworthy. Will I deny him tonight before the rooster crows? And if I do, what will he do? Will he disown me? 
Well, he did I me? Mean? Was he referring to me? And he said one of you will betray me? If I knew who that man was, I would cut him down. But would I turn the sword on myself? God, let it be not so. Yet I, I, I keep wondering and saying to myself, is it me? Lord, is it me? As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What it is you're about to do, do quickly. Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup, and he gave it to the disciples, saying to them, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink when the food is fine from now on. Until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Following the tradition set by Jesus so many years ago, we now partake of communion together. As the disciples bring the elements to you, please hold on to them until the entire congregation has been served. This is the time to ask ourselves, is it me? As we confess that we have betrayed him in silence, in anger, in actions, and in refusing to act, Lord, forgive us our sins.
Take this bread. This is my vial, given for you. Take this cup and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the sacrifice of your only begotten Son to save us from our sins. Father God, we thank you not only for the love that Jesus had for the disciples, but for the love that he has for all those who come to the table. Father, give us a hunger for you. For you graciously invite all those who are hungry to come and dine with you. He gave them bread to eat and told them that it would represent his body, broken for them and for us. He gave them wine to drink and told them that it would represent his blood, spilled for them and for us. Lord, he made access to you possible. And by his sacrifice, he became the mediator between you and man. He provided a direct connection to you so that now we can boldly enter your presence in prayer. Now we ask you, O oh God, through Jesus, help us to examine ourselves, to verify that we belong to you. And in our relationship with you, teach us to love you more and more each day. To grow closer to you each day. So that we don't have to ask the question, is it me? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
drama was well done. Those who have presented it to us have done it with excellence. But I was just thinking, if this evening, if your heart is stirred, it's not because of the excellence of the performers or the appropriate music, but it's because the Holy Spirit is in your heart. He's the one who gives us life and light. He's the one who speaks to us about our walk with Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. And tonight, if you've been stirred as I have, you need to thank God Himself, the Father, who called us into life through His Son, Jesus Christ. What a glorious, wonderful thing this is. You and I have it in our very souls. I just want to say tonight personally, and I know you join me, Father, thank you for the gift of love and the gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And we're dismissed. Greet each other. Warmly, Christian love.